Thanks, Nora. That was really helpful and um, forthright, but in a good way. Introduction that said absolutely all the all the I think important things in terms of working out how we can properly change. And I'm um, our inclusion team um, lead Rosie Sherrington should be here later and has been working on the workforce diversity strategy. So I think she'd be really interested to hear you talking about how important that is for us as we move forward. <coughs> um, I uh, have a cold like everybody else probably, so I have water and tissues and drugs. And all sorts of all sorts of other things. So I won't take the drugs while I'm speaking, but I apologise if I have to stop at any stage. Um, now officially on the programme, um, I'm just introducing the speakers, but the astute amongst you would have noticed that I have used the organisers' privilege of secretly sneaking in a few unidentified minutes between standing up at the end of Noah's presentation and um, the next uh, session starting. Um, and this is primarily because I want to just say a few things, following on really from what Duncan said about why we've done what we've done. Um, and it will be interesting to know with what I've written how, in a way, how, how Noah and others feel that that does successfully or unsuccessfully respond to the comments. Because there is no point in standing up here saying we've got it right and it's done, because neither of those things are likely to be true. There is always more to do and there is always another way to do it. So I'll try and keep this brief. I've only got um, a few slides. In 2006, Singh and Tatler stated that there was a major gap in the histories of British minority ethnic communities. Um, no great surprise now, but that was o the fact that was only really stated in 2006 is the bit that I find slightly surprising. But anyway... In 2015, there was a, um, a dissertation at the Architectural Association on the mosque in Britain and is it British heritage? And in that thesis, um, I'm just going to quote the author, um, this thesis is primarily dedicated to evaluating British mosques and their standing within British heritage, past, present, and their potential in the future. I am arguing that the mosque in Britain is misunderstood, understudied, undervalued, and under threat. The situation is contrary to that of other building types, that it and he went on to talk about other building types considered by the heritage world. Um, he talks about a heritage-less citizen, um, or a group of citizens, um, and this I do, do think reflects Noah's introduction, um, is less likely to belong and contribute to their culture and society. This follows the work, I suppose, of Stuart Hall, which many of you will be familiar with, where he talks about heritage being a mirror that's held up to British society, and that if you're not represented in the mirror, then you can't be seen. And I think that's what this student was um, alluding to. So I thought it would be helpful just to look briefly, by way of introduction, at what happened between these two periods of 2016 and 2015 in terms of what we've done. I can't talk about everything that we've done. We've done a multitude of social inclusion orientated projects, many of which Noah has already referred to, so I'm only going to talk about the faith projects. Uh, I didn't want you to go away with the impression that this is all we've done um, in terms of trying to broaden our perspective and understanding. So about the time that Singh and Tatler were writing, we were already researching some place-based work that looked at religion and place and how it operated in urban communities. Um, and it's an approach that I still really like, and I think um, it's quite a good way of getting a cross-sectional view of what faith looks like in a particular landscape. Um, the introduction to the Liverpool one um, is by the Right Reverend James Jones, who was Bishop of Liverpool in 2008. It's not possible to understand the history and heritage of Liverpool, he says, fully, without recognising and understanding how faith has shaped the contours of this great city. And I think that um, whilst faith will um, in no way represent the entirety of anyone's identity or any community's identity, it still remains fundamentally important in considering identities and considering the kind of landscape of change. In 2010, as you will guess, the unphotographed event, um, uh, I ran a thing that we just called Islamic Scoping Seminar, and it was run in Oxford. There are actually several people here today that were at this, um, and the idea was that we would look at uh, what were the issues, what were the research gaps. It had faith leaders, it had arts council, it had a kind of mix of people. And the idea was that we would try and um, talk to people that we hadn't really talked to so much before to find out what they thought of us and what they thought about the work that we should be doing. And our keynote speaker on that occasion was Dr Azim Nanji, Senior Associate Director in Islamic Studies at Stanford University. And he stated that uh, English heritage, as we were then called, 
uh, could both set a model and be a reference point for engaging diverse traditions that sit within Britain. I think recognising that diversity already exists in Britain is an important first step because the architectural diversity that they bring, the memories that they bring, do not reflect a whole genius image of Islam. They reflect a tremendous diversity and diversity in the ways in which they have original spaces of piety and spaces of devotion. So that's kind of where we were at this stage, and that was about also when Shahed was sort of embedded in the research, the beginning parts of the research of the mosque book. In 2012, um, the bottom slide is an illustration from 2012, um, our previous head of social inclusion, Rachel Hasted, organised a series of um, events about underrepresented heritage that used the terms in the Equalities Act to look at those underrepresented groups and talk to people, and it was very much about engagement rather than about telling people things. And actually, it was through one of the two faith-based events that I was speaking at that I actually met the University of Leeds contributors here today and have since then been forming and developing a kind of strong working relationship with them. So they had very specific outcomes in helping us to fill gaps, <coughs> um, which was really positive. So all of the work that you're going to hear about this morning really based is from that period of time. I, I, those of you who know me, perhaps not as many here as usually when I speak at the Antics, will know that um, uh, I always uh, write too much. And when I first started to kind of categorise this into the key points, I had about 14 of them, and then I thought you might find that was a little bit overwhelming. So I've tried to reduce it to three, which as a result means that it's sort of quite, um, quite confined. But I felt, what did I think were the key issues for me that have come out of a kind of programme about looking at faith buildings, about which previously we didn't really know very much at all? And one of them is about transition and permanence. So migrant and, trans and transitory communities um, were identified in our own consultations of 2012 that I've just described as an area that other people felt warranted more research and more visibility by us. But there is ov obviously all sorts of tensions that sit within that sort of dichotomy. There's the tension between struggling for permanence and shedding a temporary environment, so a physical temporary environment. And this isn't unique to faith that arrived in this country in the 19th and 20th century. This is you know, tin tabernacles, non-conformist chapels. It's a common pattern with communities of new faith groups, whether they've come from outside the country or inside the country in terms of their origins. There is also this very particular tension about protecting what is, from a historic um, environment management point of view, and adapting into something that somebody else wants it to be. So creating permanence out of something which is a journey towards identity. And I think a lot of our papers today will talk about that issue of how what the changes are that people are trying is about people expressing their identity. And how that, that sh you know, we need to balance that with this idea about what we protect. And it comes back to Noah's point about whose values we're protecting. Um, and then session three should um, really elicit some of the case studies that I hope will illustrate that fully. Interestingly, my next, sentence, my next paragraph, which I did cross out this morning on the train, but I'm now going to put back in and see, see what Noah says about it afterwards. I said, some authors have challenged the notion of official bodies such as ours championing minority, um, which was a word rightly or wrongly used in the title for this conference. I agonised for days about how to do this without it being a 75 word long conference title and I accept that I still didn't get it right. But there is an issue about effectively fetishising cultural difference, which I, I believe, no, is what you were trying to say. Likewise, Rowan Williams has stated, continuing to treat the minority as a political other in need of protection gives no path to authentic participation with the possibility of reciprocal influence, that is, of proper political agency. And I think what I'd originally put that in for, actually, I hope supports Noah's view that inside Historic England, there is a deep held recognition that treating everything as other and trying to assimilate into an existing way of looking at things is not the definition of diversity and inclusion. Um, and again, um, our keynote speaker from 2010 spoke about recognising the diversity that already exists in Britain as being that infer in, in, important first step. The programme of research, I mean, all of this is really, really interesting, and I, uh, like others in this room, sort of read and think about this all the time in my work and outside of my work, to my family's perpetual frustration. <laughs> and and it's, I always find the struggle, in a way, is knowing all of that and then applying it on a Monday morning at 10.30 in a meeting when you're trying to get something done. That there's a really big difference between thinking and doing. 
And part of the purpose of this conference for me is trying to bring together the thinking and the doing and how that participation is enacted in heritage protection policy. Because otherwise, there's always the risk that you have these two strands of, sort of critical heritage studies or whatever, and then heritage policy. And I think we need to work much harder to bring those together. So what we tried to do in this programme was to identify what exists. In some senses, step outside some of the debate and just go, our job is, if it already exists and it is out there in the landscape, it is already part of British cultural life and British heritage. So we will tell you what we have found as a means of stimulating a debate about what it means. And the hope is that this is done non-judgmentally. Um, and we've done this with other faith groups. And there are millions of ways we could have done this, but we chose to, um, to look at uh, individual faith group narratives as a starting point for that, which we've done with some Roman Catholic work, some Quakers and some nonconformists. And I think all of this responds to this issue at sort of number two on the screen about narrative and diversity, which is how do you create a grand narrative and acknowledge diversity at the same time? And I think that is a perpetual challenge. But knowing that both have relevance and working out how they work together, I think, is really important. The other issue here is simply uh, the old one of tangible and intangible heritage. Um, I think I did have a... Oh, yes, I did in the end. I put up these. Um, this is the Christian faith. Discuss. This is um, the Islamic faith. Discuss. This is the Buddhist faith. Um, I put these up simply to make the point that whatever we do in one document that talks about Buddhist heritage or non-conformist heritage or Quaker heritage or whatever it happens to be, this level of complexity is likely to be lost. But acknowledging that it exists and knowing that there are places that we can go afterwards is at least one step on that path, I think. Um, so just briefly, um, a lot of the participants in our 2012 um, consultation highlighted the fact that, um, it's obvious in a sense now, but that the interpretation of and the stories behind historic sites are as important as the tangible heritage because they provide it with meaning, which is something that we know. And a, quote, a couple of quotes from that. I think we should always bear in mind that there is the human aspect. It is not just about a particular building. The starting point is that we've got these buildings. How do we make them relevant? If there are no stories behind those buildings, they are a kind of disembodied from heritage. Much of what has been discovered, I think, through our faith programme um, by the projects that you're going to hear about plays into these aspirations. And it seems to me, and I, I think this will come across really clearly in the talks this morning, that, for example, the, the way that a Buddhist community approaches the conservation work of a building is as important as what comes out. And Claire's work, the way that a Sikh community thinks about adaptive change is really crucial. So we need to think not just about what we can see, but how that process was enacted. And I think I'd just like to say something about methodology. So the different methodologies that have been used for this project um, are ones that I've been thinking a lot about. And I'm an architecture historian, and I know that there are some other architects. In fact, my PhD um, examiner, architecture historian, has just walked in the room. So I know that there are people here who are going to shoot me for saying this. But I think one of the things that we've proven and learned is that architecture historians are not the only people that should write about buildings. Um, you could argue that we know quite a lot about buildings in historic England. I mean, that is our job. That is the expertise that Duncan was talking about earlier. None of the researchers, as far as I'm aware, have architectural history training, although they have lots of other relevant trainings. And I think you could argue that what they've done is bring something new that we don't have to the organisation. So understanding about faith, understanding about community building, understanding about getting a building off the ground from scratch, and also knowing who to talk to in faith groups and building a relationship with them to hear what they have to say. So I hope that this has put us into a, a kind of a listening mode rather than just a telling mode. Um, secondly, I think there is a, another me methodological issue which we need to consider as an organisation, that we need a broader toolkit of methods to encompass a variety of approaches, including more ethnographic research, a more creative practice, and more oral history. Now, these are expensive and complicated and time-consuming, but I think these projects demonstrate the value of that approach. Um, and I just wanted to end. Um, these are the, uh, this thesis that I mentioned that was written about the British Mosque in 2015, it listed these as the things that you needed to prove, in a way, I hope I'm not mis misrepresenting them, but to prove that your building type had been considered to the same level as other building types. So the claim was these things don't exist. Um, for mosques, but they do exist for churches or schools or swimming pools. So I got my little smiley face out and I decided 
that we can put a smiley face next to this one and this one and this one. Now, we haven't, I'm not suggesting that we have done all of this. That would be ridiculous. I also don't believe that a definitive list of places of worship in this country would be valid for more than about five minutes. And I, as a historian, I don't believe in definitive histories. But broadly, taking the point that we now know that there are 1,500 mosques, we now know there are, I'm going to be correct in a minute, so I'm going to say 200 Gurdwaras and about 190 Buddhist temples. We know that, and we didn't know that before, is a really sound starting point. We have had specialist interest groups, but I hope that we will develop more. I know that the people that are talking to you today have been developing peer-reviewed journals in places that are not necessarily heritage um, context, which I think is really important for us as well, to publish in new places. This one, I hope, is self-explanatory because we're here today. Um, and I think a particularly important one, proper photo archives. The photographers in Historic England are brilliant, and they've taken a multitude of photographs for the book. Um, and this has had the advantage of producing something beautiful, but also the advantage of enhancing the National Archive that we hold in Swindon. Whereas if somebody came to look for mosques 10 years ago, there would have been a handful of images of that building type, and now there will be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So I hope that is also something which, um, which creates a kind of long-lasting contribution and enables people to come back and, and look at the material through it being properly archived. So I'm hoping that what we'll get from today is really to contextualise, consolidate and develop where we've got to and see how it relates to heritage practice. So, um, without further ado, um, it would be a good time to start uh, the session that we're going to have next. And the point of this session is simply to review that work that's been done. I keep saying we as if somehow I've been doing this and Historic England's been doing this, but actually, of course, we've been... Um, facilitating other people to do all the hard graft for us, and it's those people that you're about to hear from.